Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to bring the IQ level down a little bit here. Certainly in the last couple talks, I, I didn't even know some of those things that were going on at Stanford. And I've been at Stanford for 26 years. So I really commend the last two speakers, the last three speakers, actually. But there's some very exciting issues that are happening towards healthcare that I think are something that we should just spend a few minutes on. Before we do that, folks, if you've not read this book, you probably should. Adam Grant is a business psychologist at Wharton. He wrote Option B with Shel Sandberg uh, some about a year and a half ago, two years ago. But what it really does is it makes us think about the mistakes, admitting those mistakes, and understanding that they're a powerful way to learn, to rethink things. And I have to tell you folks, in healthcare, we definitely need to rethink. And in the last 18, 24 months, we've had a forcing function globally that is making us rethink things. The global digitization world, produced by the third and fourth industrial revolution, is now colliding with the consumerization of health. We need to rethink, recalculate, redeploy mature technologies in other verticals to helping with the journey of people in their health process. As physicians, we tend to think because of the episodic care, when you have chest pain, you see me. I don't remember your name a week later. We need to think about patients, our people, but more importantly, they become consumers, utilizing this digital world that we live in. Now, let me tell you why we need to rethink this, especially in the United States. We spend more money than anybody globally, and we live less long. Do you know that we have the highest maternal death rate in the United States compared to all those other countries? That's not sustainable. Neither is this when you have cancer. The hospital costs are high, patient reimbursement is low, premiums have been increasing, copays have been decreasing. These aren't my statistics, this is the American Medical Association. 41% of people that undergo cancer therapy after 16 months are destitute. Now we probably don't know a lot of people in this room like that, but believe me, there are a lot of people that mortgage their house after they get cancer therapy. Let me just give you an example of the most recent drug that was approved by the FDA called Zolkinji. It treats a very uh, bad disease for children called progeria, accumulation of many proteins in cells. It gets diagnosed about six months into life and usually these folks leave us about 16 years old. But this treatment, every 90 days, or excuse me, every 30 days, cost $90,000. That's not sustainable, especially in the setting of when we have other issues that are a little bit more tenored, if you will, in healthcare. Consider the fact that in the United States, we use biologics. In Europe, they use biosimilars. Sometimes there's a difference of 50 times the price. We need to rethink, we need to think differently. Spending that amount of money on specialty pharmaceuticals that really treat, in that last case, 400 patients worldwide. When a veteran in this country commits suicide every 53 minutes, they don't die in Afghanistan, they die in Arkansas when they come back. So we have a dissymmetry here that could potentially be much more appropriated from an equitable standpoint with digital technologies. There's another issue that's going on in healthcare and some of the technologies that you folks talk about as these companies, these innovations, especially as you've heard in the last two talks, get invested upon. There's a monotonic increase and let's not argue about the relative size going from series A's to V's, C's, D's. But we usually have had the private equity folks, the growth folks, and the secondaries on the sideline. Today, they've come off the sidelines in a significant way, such that there's a squeeze on A's. And for those that don't know the tulip effect, called tulipemia, in the 17th century, you know, Dutch merchants purchased all the tulips, and what do you think happened to the price of tulips? 
This is tulip mania that we're living in today, and we need to compensate a little bit for that overvaluation. That generation of unicorns, of which there's almost 900 of them worldwide, commanding a value of over $3 trillion. Why? Because these new technologies, exciting technologies, together with regulation changes and new business models, the twillows, the snowflakes of the world, going after some Zs, some Xs, and a lot of millennials that control 25% of the wealth. But you know who controls most of the wealth? It's the baby boomers, 60% of the household wealth. And those are the folks with chronic disease. Those are the consumers with chronic disease. So what you begin to see is not only a participation of the standard health care issues that have been addressed historically, but now we're beginning to think differently. We need to move from rule-based heuristic care to more probabilistic data-driven care so we can identify the right consumers at the right time for the right therapies during their health journey. We see a coalescence of disciplines, and maybe that's in part while I'm here, that we not only are moving from the standard folks that have participated in life science, but we're seeing the information technology, the social media, the retail health, Walmarts of the world, CVS is the world, participate in this health journey. And now, in the last couple years, the entertainment folk, Bose, Nike, Netflix. You say, why Netflix? Well, because Netflix can potentially get disinterested Dave, who says he's going to exercise tomorrow, but he's got a, one hand on a clicker, the other hand on a pizza, but he's got both eyes on the screen. And rather than the Daves coming to see me with chest pain, that tail end of the distribution, Netflix can begin to engage consumers. They know how to engage consumers. They know from gaming, from gambling, guilt, rewards, socialization, family pressure, and advertisement. So we need to reach back before the curve bends in the wrong direction and try to bend it in a more stable or hopefully the right direction. And that's what I get excited about, having practiced medicine for 30 years. The last five years is one of the most exciting tipping points that you're going to ever see in healthcare. I get the opportunity to take care of patients in their living room now, take care of these people, take care of those consumers. Why? Because not only is it made efficient by technologies we have at our hand, but this is a guy named Paul. Paul would come to our ER for the last five to eight years, five, six times a year. Now I take care of Paul on his couch. I invite his family. I explain what his heart looks like. I explain what his rhythm looks like. And I engage not just Paul, but his children, his spouse involved in Paul's care. Paul, in the last three years, has not been to the hospital at all. So it's really important to embrace these technologies, engage the consumer for the journey and not the episodic care that we have practiced so much. And if I'm talking to a consumer at home or talking to that person that has a health challenge in person, we have NLP issues that can linguistically convert immediately into our EHR, into our health records without typing it. Sometimes I have to edit it, but I'd rather edit 2% than type in 100% because I'm not looking at the people with health. I'm looking at my screen. So this technology has helped us tremendously. We're seeing the dissemination of diagnosis out to different parts of the world because you can now, on your cell phone, with ultrasound, be able to figure out if you have a heart problem, to be able to figure out if you have an artery that's clogged without going through the train of specialists so that you can triage that consumer at the right time, the right place, to the right therapies. This spectrum of health that is being digitally embraced from wellness, fitness, fintech, insurtech, cybersecurity, behavioral health, mental health, to elder care is a wealth of data. There's more data in healthcare than any other vertical, whether it's banking, finance, oil and gas. Healthcare has more data. And we're learning to redirect 
these data manipulation, mature technologies in other industries into healthcare. And that's really important. Now there's spatial data and there's temporal data. Temporal over time for treating patients. This is spatial data. You can have curated pixels of a chest x-ray, a hand x-ray, a pathology slide be done much, much quicker than a pathologist or a radiologist. That's easy. Now you have to figure out the business model that's gonna make that work and be embraced, but that's fairly easy to do. What's harder to do is the spectrum of care over time. So meet Tom. Tom has essential tremor. Essential tremor, there's 14 million people in this country that shake. Their right hand shakes a little bit more than their left hand. Generally what I'll do is I'll put a pacemaker in their chest and thread a wire up to their ventral intermediate nucleus and tune it so that Tom stops shaking. But you know what happens over time? Tom starts shaking again. So you really need to take advantage of things where we analyze Tom's shake on his right hand, on his left hand, Tom versus somebody else, and do the neurostimulation right where the problem is, at the wrist. So you analyze the accelerometry, the changes that happen over time, and continue to learn about Tom and allow him then not to spill his coffee in the morning and be able to bring a fork with his pasta successfully into his mouth. Meet Mary, who has Parkinson's disease. Mary learns how her Parkinson's disease is affected by some of her deep brain stimulators. But now Mary can utilize Samsung technology and program the duty cycle. So if she wants to go to a concert tonight, she's able not to shake the program. Whereas maybe tomorrow night, she doesn't need that same duty cycle. Again, there's a lot of people over time, like Mary, that's integrated into the boundaries of what Mary can control about herself. Meet Maggie, Maggie has blood pressure problems, but Maggie's already on two blood pressure medications. She's got a little bit of chronic kidney disease and she's had Crohn's disease in the past. Now if I'm a 30 year old doctor, I haven't seen a lot of Maggie's. I'm much older, I've seen a ton of Maggie's. But what we wanna do is take temporal data, integrate it in from 160,000 people over five to 10 years that look just like Maggie, and be able to come up with a hierarchical outcome, whether I'm 30 years old or whether I'm 60 years old. What this does is just standardizes the care from Boston to Santa Clara. And this is an important issue with respect to our healthcare efficiency. This is CVS. They're getting rid of the potato chips and the peanuts and making way for folks with dialysis. They get dialyzed on aisle seven now. Why, because these poor people need diapers and they need drugs. And the largest margin that CVS appreciates on an annual basis is their drugs. So being able to Uberize and bring the necessary components to these poor dialysis folks, again, is utilized by some of the cross-convergence technologies that we're appreciating. Now I know, I know the mention of robotics was, was uh, highlighted a couple talks ago, Ennis did that, it's amazing, but we're seeing the same thing in healthcare. Why, because the hand-eye coordination of the 30-year-olds is pretty good these days. So what we're able to do is actually move catheters in people's heart and either open up their arteries when they had a heart attack or fix their valves when they've become inefficient. And that is a very unique opportunity to do, brought to you by the coordination that you saw, at least for the manufacturing process. And now we can do it nine feet away or we can do it 900 miles away, thanks to the minimal latency from cloud computing and some of the accelerations that NVIDIA has brought to the... We have done and put in stents hundreds of miles away. But if you have a heart attack right now, I got five hospitals you can go to and get your stent. But this technology has matured for this particular application. This is a stroke, when one of the blood vessels in the middle part of the slide needs to be filled with dye, but it's not. Okay, now let's talk about stroke 
and let's say I'm in Modesto with my stroke. There's 925,000 people that have a stroke in this country alone, 650 in Japan, 775 in Europe. 22% of those folks do die, but 56% have permanent disabled conditions, and that's a huge healthcare expenditure. Now, if I'm in Modesto and I get in an ambulance to come to the places that can pull that blood clot out, which is Stanford, UCSF, O'Connor, I'm losing 1.9 neurons per minute, 14 billion synapses, and a lot of myelinated fiber. At least in my brain, I don't want to have that happen as I'm waiting on 680 for the traffic to get better. Helicopters, sure, you can do that. But what we could do now is use that same technology you saw and from UCSF or Stanford, pull out that blood clot in that patient in Modesto within an hour or so. So these are, again, embracing cross-convergence technologies brought to you by some of the lectures you saw in manufacturing and putting those together for being able to guide us quickly, efficiently, to treat patients at a distance. This is dissemination of care. This is equitable appropriation of care. And this is brought to you by the convergence of what we've seen today between technology meets the consumerization of health. This is a hospital in the Midwest. The difference between this hospital and the hospital you'll see down in San Jose is there's no patients in it. It's just healthcare providing, take healthcare providers taking care of 12 other hospitals. But they do it in the same exact way. They admit a patient in the same way. They put a tube down their throat to breathe the same way. They take it out the same way. All of a sudden, you standardize care. You're collecting data tremendously. So the acuity of how you continue to treat in those 12 hospitals is always optimized. Again, that's the issue that we need to think about for the future of healthcare. Because hospitals are going to change. How you train healthcare professionals, which by the way, we have a huge gap in today. In 2021, we lost almost 325,000 nurses in the United States. That's a big problem. We're going to see training. I trained in medical school by cutting up dead people. Today, we train youngsters with 3D calligraphy. So we can combine not only the anatomy with the physiology. We're going to see rehabilitation change once people leave the hospital to home or skilled nursing facilities while technology is tracking those patients the whole way. So going to the hospital isn't going to be the same. These will be comprehensive care facilities and begin to outreach through robotics, dissemination of care to the community hospitals. We need community hospitals. We just need the same level of care that you get at the epic centers. But this dissemination, again, is from technology alone. This picture here is from the basement of a hospital in Texas. They not only monitor the patients when they're there, but they monitor the people when they leave, and ultimately the consumer when they go home. And again, this is all powered by things we have certainly become used to in the fourth industrial revolution with some of the Google technology, the Apple technology, Amazon and Facebook. And this is really something that is going to change the face of healthcare. Now, there is a dark side to this, too, as we disseminate, as we adopt 5G. So we need to be careful of that, because the trust in this, in handling the information that you have about your particular healthcare, needs to be protected. And we're going to see advances in this, not only encryption, not only in synthetic data, but one of the things that we can really do is what's called federated learning, which most of you probably know a heck of a lot more than I do about it. But it's getting the envelope, getting the insights, and then coalescing the insights, whether it be a cloud or whether it be on some other local server. Those insights are completely protectable. Think about Waze in Israel. They didn't care what car you were in. They didn't care who was in the car with you. They didn't care where you stopped. But they took the envelope information. They took the insights from that and scaled on Google Maps. This is what we're going to see with respect to protectability, 
of patients' information and scalability, dissemination, and equitable care throughout the world. So in conclusion, patients are consumers, and they are expecting changes. Products are being enhanced by analytics and discovery from those data. True partnerships with IT and life science is happening in abundance. I work with Netflix and Nike a little bit more than I do Johnson & Johnson. We need to rethink, just like Adam Grant says, global health care, virtual hospitals, home care, robotics, remote care, and of course security. In other words, we need to bend that curve in a better direction than what we've appreciated in the United States so far. Thank you very much for your attention.